Stanford University. Hi, everybody. I am Jessica Kahn, and I am director of engineering at Tapulous. We're the makers of the number one game on the iPhone, and we're located right here in Palo Alto. And it is a pleasure to come and talk to you today about the company and how it's developed over the last year and you know, what we're doing in the future as well. So to get started, I'm just going to play you a video, which you got a sneak peek of a moment ago while we were organizing our audio. I'll call you back. So, as you probably gathered, that was a promo video for Tap Tap Revenge 2, which is our flagship product. We shipped it earlier this year. Uh, it's the 2.0, obviously, of Tap Tap Revenge, uh, which is the most installed app on the App Store. Uh, we have 32% market penetration, so according to Comscore, these are numbers from April, we were at one time or another installed on one of every three iPhone or iPod Touch devices. We are the most downloaded game on the App Store, according to Apple itself, uh, numbers released in December as well as in April. We have 10 million unique installs. We have 3 million unique users per month. We've had 100 million games played in Tap Tap Revenge. Our featured track, which we release late Wednesday into Thursday, called Tap Tap Thursdays, gets downloaded at times, if it's a popular track, 500 times in a single week. 500,000 times, sorry. We also have a business in premium games, where we sell them for $4.99. Um, they're based on the Tap Tap Revenge engine, but we partner with bands like Coldplay. This is the most recent one that we released. And in total, we've sold 250,000 units of those paid games. So we've sold Nin games, we've sold Weezer games, we've sold Coldplay games. Uh, it's a, it's a good, little, good little business. And then another product of ours which is quite popular is Twinkle. So Twinkle um, is known in part for being a, an application that you can post to Twitter from. But additionally, it posts messages to the Tapulous network and you can post sort of to your local area. So you boot up Twinkle and you can see messages being posted within 50 miles of you, no matter what sort of account you have. If you're on, not on Twitter, it doesn't matter. We've had a total of 25 million messages posted from Twinkle. So that was just a really quick one run through of where we're at as a company, um, just to show you that you can have fantastic success developing iPhone applications. You can reach tremendous numbers of users. Um, it's good fun, it's good profit. Uh, I highly recommend it, I do it as my living. So the rest of the talk is a little bit more sedate, no more fun videos, no more crazy statistics, but it's just kind of gonna be me explaining who I am, who Tapulous is, core principles related to software startups in general. Troy um, explained to me that you guys are budding entrepreneurs and maybe wanna know a little bit about how to turn your iPhone development skills into a business. Um, and then specifically, because I'm director of engineering and I know how to do engineering as a process, I want to speak to some successful iPhone software development tactics and practices. And then we can wrap up and do Q&A. And this is totally informal. So at any time, if you guys want to ask a question, feel free to interrupt me. Um, not a problem at all. So my background. Um, 
I'm definitely a mix of formal training and a lot of improvisation. I do not have an engineering degree. I got a psychology degree. Um, <laughs> I took some engineering classes in college, though. I just came to it really late. I didn't realize until I was a senior that this was kind of what I was meant to do. And I couldn't believe how fun it was and that people would pay me to do it. Um, so I got my first job at a streaming video startup doing quality assurance. And I got laid off two months out of school. It was traumatic. And it was fantastic luck. It was the best thing that ever happened to me because it allowed me to go get a job as a very entry level Mac software developer. <laughs> and then I got laid off again. And this is something you're going to learn once you get out of school and you go into business. In high tech, you got to roll with the punches. It's a very fast changing environment. You almost assuredly will get laid off. And if you don't get laid off, you're not doing it right. So I got laid off again. And that was close second in terms of Fantastic luck, best thing that ever happened to me because I parlayed that into my job at Apple. So I was at Apple for nearly 10 years. Um, I joined there as an entry level software developer. I ported the help system from Mac OS 8 to Mac OS 10. I did the help system, I did Sherlock, I uh, did the pub sub platform, which does RSS underneath all of the applications in the OS that support it, and it's a public API. I managed the team that did that as well and did some social software experiments. Most recently, I was a senior engineer on the Safari Mac platform team. Great 10-year run. And then Tapulous came calling. I was not planning to leave Safari. I was not planning to leave Apple. But this just struck me as a fantastic opportunity. So they knocked on my door and said, come run engineering for us. And I said, OK. And it's been eight months there for me. Tapulous's evolution, uh, while shorter, is nonetheless action-packed. So uh, I'll back up only to about a year ago. Um, when the founders of Tapulous were stating that the mission of Tapulous was to be the slide or the rock you of the iPhone. So what did they mean by that? They meant, let's put out a smattering of little things that are relatively quick to develop, low cost as a result, get them out there and get sort of very broad penetration versus very deep penetration. Let's have lots of users, but they don't all have to be using the same thing. Well, we did that, or started to do that, and we found that one of our things was a runaway hit, <laughs> and that was TapTap Tap Revenge. So by fall of 08, we had millions of users on TapTap Tap Revenge. It was growing at an incredible rate, and we kind of realized that we would be really silly not to focus our efforts on that. So by fall of 08, we decided, OK, let's refocus. We're going to be a music gaming company for the iPhone. We're going to be the dominant music gaming company for the iPhone. That's definitely been the mission that we're executing on right now. So that brings us to Spring 09, right now. What are we doing? Well, we are building our network. What you may not know, but what you caught a glimpse of in that video I showed you, is that we have a network behind our game. And we're exposing it more and more in internet-enabled game features. So we want people to be playing in massive online multiplayer rooms. We want people to do Challenge a Friend, as you were seeing in the video. We want people to have tapulous accounts and avatars and things that they win and abilities to talk trash to their friends and encourage their friends to play the game. And so that's a big focus of ours right now. And all those are ways in which we're working to keep users engaged. In addition to building the network to keep users engaged, we think it's really important to offer users really high quality content. And so we are working around the clock to book the best bands into our game, basically. Um, so we had, I don't know, in the last couple of weeks, we've had some really major hits, um, including, I think, this past week's uh, top Tap Tap Thursday's track had been in the Billboard top five for sure. It might even have been top one uh, pretty recently. Um, Summer 09, which you guys are probably all aware of, is iPhone OS 3.0. So I have to stress to you, and I feel very deeply and somewhat stressed by myself, if you don't pay attention to the fact that iPhone OS 3.0 is coming and the smoke signals are all indicating that it's coming sooner than later, right? Apple says summer of 09. And often you can interpret that to be, well, all uh, right, that's going to be like September 21st. I don't think so. Personally, the smoke signals are telling to me that this is coming sooner than that. And be ready. Be developing your features for iPhone OS 3.0 now. Because if you're first out the gate using really cool APIs that only exist in 3.0, you're going to gain momentum and you're going to leave your competition behind. It's really important. If you don't do that, they're going to leave you behind. The other thing about that is that Numbers have shown that users of iPhone and iPod Touch upgrade their OS very, very quickly. So don't be overly concerned that you're going to target OS 3.0 and cut out a bunch of your users. I don't think that's a big concern. So no matter what, even if you're not trying to be the dominant music gaming company in the iPhone sphere, just no matter what you're doing in the iPhone sphere, or really any software startup sphere, you got to focus on building a great team, 
you gotta focus on strengthening your brand. You gotta work to become more predictable about what you're doing because people don't want to invest in you and you're gonna have a hard time attracting that great team if you can't reliably turn out results. But you gotta work to become more predictable in a way that doesn't kill your creativity and your energy. Um, and seek out and listen to advice. So, so this section of my talk really is speaking to the guys out here and the women out here who want to be entrepreneurs. This is what I've been learning coming from 10 years in big, big company to now being entrepreneurial myself. So building a great team. I, I know iPhone development is appealing because you can do it by yourself and I won't discourage you from doing it by yourself, but wow, if you have a great team, you can do a lot more and you can do it a lot faster. And so I would say try to build a great team if you can and here's how you should do it. Don't be afraid to be very selective. So you're building a business and there are time pressures contributing to you wanting to ship products as fast as you possibly can. And boy, did we suffer through this in the last six months. Our team was too small. And on a daily basis, we were turning away projects that we really wanted to do, but we just didn't have the bandwidth to do them. Very, very painful spot to be in. Guess what? It's much more painful if you staff up with the wrong people <laughs> and then you're stuck with them and they can wreak havoc in your company. And so I say, take the pain of not being able to do the projects as quickly as you want and wait and be very selective about the people that you hire. Um, when you're hiring, especially in, especially in developing iPhone apps where the entire platform is brand new and it's built upon a platform where the skill set was highly specialized and so your pool of applicants would be pretty small anyway, um, don't worry so much about whether people have the skill set that you desire. So when you're picking somebody to found your company with, I wouldn't care so much that they've got five years of Mac OS X development experience. Look for the person who has the passion that you have and look for the person who has the integrity that you want and they will build the skills. Um, and so to me, when I'm looking for people to hire, I, I care about passion and integrity foremost. Um, be super flexible about job descriptions when you're a small company or when you're just yourself and you're looking for somebody to partner with. Um, if you're too rigid, you are not gonna find the right person. Uh, the right person will have walked by and you're not gonna judge them to be right because they didn't fit your 10 bullet points. What I always say to people when they come in an interview and they say, well, what job description am I applying for? I say, it doesn't really matter. We'll build the job description to fit you. If you're the right person, it doesn't matter. You know, we'll, we'll make the job work. Um, that said, as you grow, you need to make sure to diversify. And what do I mean by that? Sure, of course, you want a mix of men and women and different backgrounds, but specifically what I'm speaking to is expertise. You want different kinds of expertise, but you also want different levels of expertise. So Tapulous today, we were just talking about this at a company meeting literally an hour ago. Just this week, we hit sort of critical mass of feeling like we have the right team. It's an excellent team, it's 15 people now. I have six developers and three designers uh, working with me, and then we have a couple of other people in the company that are doing marketing and doing community, but, but in terms of the engineering and the, and the design, it's, it's nine people plus myself. And we have a really good spread of backgrounds and skill sets. So some of us are hardcore, old school Apple people, some of us are back-end engineers with Ruby on Rails and you know, MySQL experience. Um, some of us have been in industry for 12 years. Some of us are brand new to it. Some of us are still in school or have one or two years of experience. And having that mixture is extremely, it just builds the right energy. Um, so I, I would say, I caution you to make sure that you diversify in that way. The other thing that Tapulous focuses on um, at least as much as team is brand. So this is gonna differ um, company to company. Not everybody is gonna agree with what I view as the important things to strengthen your brand. But for me, we have to invest very heavily in the aesthetics. We care about how every pixel looks. Part of that is because many of us are from deep Apple backgrounds where it was totally unacceptable if a button was one pixel to the left of where it ought to be. And I kid you not, why my last task at on the Safari team was making a button that had the right size green gradient etched text in an oval button. And I was told to spend as long as I needed to spend to get it to look absolutely perfect. And it took me two weeks, <laughs> but it was the right investment to make. And Tapulous continues with that, that sort of investment. So we care a lot about how things look. Um, don't compromise too much, oh, sorry. Are you guys just off University Avenue? I think I might have walked down. We're on Hamilton. Mm -hmm. 
feel free to stop in. We're in a storefront on Hamilton. Yeah. Uh, sorry, he just asked, are we located in uh, just off University in Palo Alto? Yes, we are near the Palo Alto Creamery. So um, my next bullet point is a little controversial. In fact, my boss, the founder of Tapulus, one of the founders of Tapulus, Bart, saw this bullet and he really wanted me to remove too much. He wanted me to say, don't compromise on quality. I say, don't compromise too much on quality. So, right, you gotta be realistic. Software ships with bugs. And when you're in school, I remember feeling like, well, no, 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 I can, I can get the list complete of everything I know is wrong with this product and I can fix all of those bugs and then I just won't release it until I'm done fixing the bugs. That is not reality. The reality is that there's one bug in every 10 lines of code. <laughs> and you are not gonna fix them all before you ship or you are never gonna ship. So what I caution you to do is don't compromise too much on quality. Make sure that you select the right things to fix before you ship and then there are some trade-offs because if you wait too long, your brand is meaningless because you missed the boat. Your competition just took you over. Um, use Twitter and YouTube and other community-driven sites to strengthen your brand. So this is something that's accessible to everyone, even a one-person company, because these things are free. Get a Twitter account, start interacting with your community, post viral videos on YouTube. The video like what I showed you is not a tremendous investment to make if you find a buddy who's good with video editing skills. Do those things, get them posted, and it's amazing the kind of buzz that you can generate. We've been working hard on building our Twitter following in the last just maybe three weeks, and I think we're gaining uh, about 1,000 followers a week. We're running contests through Twitter, and it's really building our buzz basically for free, just with a little bit of time spent. Um, piggyback on Apple's marketing prowess. So Apple is one of the most successful brands, if not the most successful brand in the world, sort of ever, right? Look at what they're doing right and mimic it. And then they might like you and market you for free. That's huge. They do that with iPhone apps. They do that with iPhone apps for companies like us. They do that for big companies like Facebook. But they do that for individual developers too. Um, the guy who made DrumKit, I know, his stuff has ended up on billboards all over America. He's one guy, he made this one app, and Apple promotes him totally for free with advertising that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce. So bear in mind what Apple likes to promote and build things that they're gonna like. So I mean, and I can't stress this enough, we think about it right down to what colors are we putting in our game. They like primary colors. Focus on primary colors if that's what Apple likes. Pay attention to what their aesthetics are and mimic them to the extent that you think it might help you know, piggyback on their marketing. The last thing I'm gonna say about strengthening your brand is that in the iPhone marketplace in particular, those store rankings and ratings you may think they're kind of BS and that people are gaming them all the time and you know, oh, the ratings stink because it's too easy for people to accidentally submit a one-star rating or you know, oh, it's not fair because they you know, value the ratings of people who uninstall your app too much and then it's the people who keep your app and love it, never get a chance to rate it. All that may be true, too bad. <laughs> those ratings and those rankings really matter. Do not disregard them. So we make a ton of decisions about how quickly we're gonna do something and what we're gonna do based on how our rankings are trending and how our ratings are going. So at the moment, just to give you a really concrete example, Tap Tap Revenge 2, which is our flagship product, is three and a half stars. That's completely unacceptable. That means, you know, people like us. We want people to love us, right? We've got 10 million users who all together think, yeah, this is pretty good. Well, if we can get it up to four stars, how many more millions of users are we gonna have? Probably a lot. And so pay attention to those ratings and keep yourself at four, four and a half stars if you possibly can. Okay, so that's enough about brand, enough about team. Um, again, so let's say that you're building yourself a business. You're not just sort of a singleton iPhone developer, you're building a business. A really important thing to learn to do is to become more predictable. So this is not the fun part of my job, right? This is the part of my job that is totally not sexy. Um, but you need to know exactly what needs to go, go into any given release. So don't, don't fly by the seat of your pants if you can possibly help it. Sit down and plan your releases out. Get a ticket tracking system in place. There are tons of good free ones where if you're just you know, one to five users or so, sign up online, use the ticket tracking, get serious about it. That allows you to track how long it takes to get that work that you planned for done. So you'll know, okay, in May I planned to do these 10 features and these four bug fixes. And wow, here it is July, 
And I finished all those, but then along the way, 10 more things got added. And you can look back and see, okay, it took me two and a half months to do these 25 things of this rough complexity. Therefore, I know the next product I'm gonna make of this similar complexity is gonna take me two and a half months. That's really, really valuable if you're trying to build a business out of this. If you have a team, get status from your team regularly. My team hates this. It's terrible. I feel, I feel awful every morning that I do this to them, and yet it's totally necessary. Everyone is on the phone at 9 a.m., and they're telling me what did they do yesterday and what are they doing tomorrow and are they blocked and do they need assistance. It takes 15 minutes to get that status from nine people. It's not that big a deal. It's 15 minutes of pain every morning, but it's, I can't even tell you how much better we're executing on being able to get products out the door quickly, uh, having put that process in place. And uh, a buzzword that you could pay attention to about that is Scrum. You may have heard that before. It's a project management style. You can do a little Googling about it. So I am not like a Scrum lunatic, but one thing from Scrum that's very helpful is this status retrieval from your team on a regular basis, probably early in the morning, um, real quick. Last thing is, um, the other unpleasant part of my job is that I'm the one who says no. So the crazy founders come in and say, oh Jess, this release is gonna be so much better if we could just make it like, you know, cook people's toast in the morning before, you know, but just, just make it do this crazy thing. And it's like, uh, no, we need to ship. We have to ship, I have to say no. And so become super conservative when you're getting ready to ship. You can put that next feature in the next release. You'll, you'll finish this one and you'll start on the next release right away. So finish this one. Um, at the very end, I'm a big proponent of code reviews. So a little secret about the Safari team, which, you know, is going to sound draconian. Nothing gets checked in on the Safari team without a code review. Every single change in that source tree is code reviewed. <laughs> That's draconian to a degree that I could not make swing at Tapulous. No way are my guys going to be like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to check anything in until, you know, we get a code review. Not going to fly. But... What I did put in place, which is fantastic, is sort of like, hmm, code review without even realizing it. So now all the engineers have diffs, prettified diffs in HTML email showing up in their mailboxes. Oh, sure. So um, the question is about iPhone OS 3.0 and the fact that I'm enthusiastic about developing for it in a timely fashion and what are the features that you know, make me enthusiastic about it. So um, I think you have to be an iPhone developer to... Uh, get a lot of detail about the different APIs, and so I wouldn't want to overstep what I'm allowed to say under NDA. Um, however, I do know that some publicly announced things, you know. Yeah, well, but this is being broadcast to like the world, so I do have to be super careful. Um, and do not want to burn my bridges at Apple, which is a fantastic place. So um, what I can say is the stuff that I know is publicly talked about, right? So one of the hugest deals, I think, is uh, micro microtransactions and in-app commerce. So that's huge. Um, the fact that we can allow people to buy little things that don't cost much money, um, I think that that's, that's a tremendous thing, not just for Tapulous. That's a tremendous thing for everyone who's developing iPhone apps, and one might be remiss to not try to sell your users something. I know that sounds terribly commercial of me, but my job is to run a commercial company, so think about commerce. <laughs> um, there are lots of other neat features. I mean, I remember things related to um, Bluetooth, sort of ad hoc, you know, networking, where you can join a network together and, and do, uh, in essence, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, networking, which is great for games in particular. Um, but yeah, I would say go to the Apple developer website to get sort of the full list of really neato 3.0 features. But there's just it's cram packed with lots of really amazing new stuff, um, and they're on beta five now, so it's it's pretty far along in terms of being able to work with the platform and, and test things out. Okay, so the last thing about being a conservative when you're getting ready to ship, try to get people to review code. It is really helpful. Um, you learn a ton from your colleagues. Even myself, as someone who's been developing software for 12 years, I learn things by watching what my colleagues are checking in. Um, and I catch things that are getting checked in that were mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Even really excellent, incredibly senior rock star developers accidentally comment something out and check it in. And just having those diffs show up in email, we catch a lot of those things and it saves a lot of time and money and sometimes heartache. Um, finally, as you're getting ready to ship, just get super strict about what you'll accept into your source tree. Don't let people check crazy things in. Uh, we have a concept of blockers where we take blockers only. So do not check anything in unless it's considered something that would block the release. And then do betas. I mean, Apple doesn't provide a super easy way to do betas because you're limited to numbers of devices you can distribute things to and such, but, but there is a way to do betas. And I think you'd be remiss to not set up a great beta program. And we have 
so many enthusiastic beta people. We have people asking every day to join our beta program. These, you know, crazy 12 to 17 year old kids who play our game four hours a day and are thrilled to be able to help us by testing the game. They do a great job for us. It's totally free. And uh, I recommend that you leverage them as well. Okay, so that was like me being a drag, me being boring, me saying no to people, me, you know, stopping the process from going crazy. But if you don't go crazy, A, you're not having any fun, and B, you're not doing anything innovative and, and creative. So encourage creativity. How do we do that at Tapulous? Well, we've tried on the 20% time thing, which is, you know, like one fifth of any developer's time could be done, could be used doing anything that they want to do. Um, no oversight from me, and uh, I don't much care what it is, but if they get excited about it and want to show it to me, then fantastic, and maybe we'll take it and develop it into a product. Um, we've tried that. That's not what we're doing currently, but it does work. It's been proven to work at Google. Um, it's a good recipe. What we're doing right now is basically Skunkworks, so in an informal way. Skunkworks, by definition, is uh, that there's a group of people who are very loosely managed, um, there's very little bureaucracy or oversight, and they just get to do really crazy things, but it's not limited to like one-fifth of their time. So I do not have the luxury of allowing my guys to go off and do skunk works all day, right? I have products that we can't build fast enough. So the unfortunate reality of like the crazy little iPhone startup is that skunk works is what you do at 10 p.m. But my guys are so excited about the fact that they can go off and do whatever they want to do, and that maybe we'll make it into a product that goes to millions of people if they do it well, they do it from like 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. sometimes, right? So they get their work done that I needed them that they committed to do in the morning, and then they go do these skunk works things, and one of them is actually gonna ship probably next week. So um, encourage your guys to be creative. Just also balance it with needing to get your company objectives you know, fulfilled. Um, facilitate healthy brainstorming. So this is totally corporate of me, and I don't know how many of you have been in a corporate environment, but this is a good corporate thing. Brainstorming is something that you actually have to like you have to facilitate. You have to think hard about how it's being done. Because as engineers, right, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got from a, a VC maybe, I don't know, 12, 10, 12 years ago, he said, Jess, you're smart enough that I would hire you to run a company, but the problem is you're too much of an engineer. I said, well, what's that? Why is that a problem? He said, because as soon as I say an idea to you, you find fault in it. You go poking for all the places where it's broken. Well, that's a great thing for an engineer to do, right? Terrible thing for an entrepreneur to do. Terrible, terrible thing. And so this is why I say you have to facilitate healthy brainstorming, particularly in an engineering organization, because no ideas are going to make it through to being able to be developed, because all your guys are going to very healthfully pick them apart and break them all down. And so pick someone who's really good at sort of bolstering new ideas and, and encouraging people to be creative and, and not shooting things down and make sure that those ideas are sort of facilitated through to being, you know, being thought out and being able to be acted upon. And finally, stay flexible. So um, again, I, said, I think I said earlier that you're doing it wrong if you don't get laid off. If you're working in high tech, right? You're not taking enough risks, probably. Um, similarly, if you're trying to build a startup and you don't change course probably like by 90 to 180 degrees every several months, you're doing it wrong, <laughs> probably. I mean, I can't say that you know, with 100% surety, but it's pretty, pretty likely that if you're not being flexible enough that you're changing course to meet changing market demands and you know, new things in particular in this marketplace from Apple, you're doing it wrong. So um, just stay flexible and change your company's plans as, as needed and periodically. Last thing in the boring part of the talk, and then I'll get a little more engineering um, on you. I had to learn to seek advice from people because right, with 10 years at Apple, I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody about what I worked on other than my like 10 person team. <laughs> um, no one could know who I was. No one could know what I worked on. I wasn't allowed to talk to customers. I couldn't go out and have coffee with like peers of mine at other companies. Um, I certainly couldn't talk to any of our current or potential investors. So one of the really awesome things about working in the Bay Area in particular and in a software startup is that, wow, is this area packed with incredibly intelligent people who are all doing wild and crazy and really exciting things. And it's very convivial. It's almost like being in a university environment where people actually, I mean, it's competitive, but people also want to share advice, talk about what they're doing, um, help each other out. And so... Take advantage of that, would be my advice. Okay, so a little more engineering savvy stuff now. 
Um, what are the successful iPhone software development practices that I've figured out over the last eight months? Backing up though, what did I learn in school? If you struggle with a crazy bug and you start to suspect the compiler, as I bet many of you have, you're wrong. It's not the compiler, it's totally you. What I learned at Apple, actually it might be the compiler. <laughs> so at Apple, right, I was working on these bleeding edge operating systems, the tools were changing out from under us all the time, and there were crazy compiler bugs. So now I arrive at Tapulous and it's a mix. So now the crazy bugs, well, they're probably not the compiler, but it may very well be some crazy edge case in this brand new platform. And you know, it's not to slight the platform, it's fantastic. It's extremely rich, it moves extremely quickly, and it's very new. And it's highly advanced considering it's you know, less than two years old. Fact is, whether it's the tools or whether it's you, blame is unimportant. Um, you have to tackle the problem. It doesn't matter where it came from. And so what I would advise you to do even more than making yourself the most rock star coder who can spit out reams of incredible new code, learn how to deal with existing code bases, especially on the iPhone and its crazy platform. Hone your problem solving skills this way. You can never, ever, ever be too good at GDB. I mean, I've been using GDB for 12 years. There are things I do not know how to do in GDB. I ought to know how to do them. I should set aside 10 minutes every day for learning a new thing in GDB. I recommend you do the same. You can never be too good at Googling things. Many, many, many people are out there suffering the same problems that you are and just learn how to find them and <laughs> learn what they're talking about on their blogs, right? And take advantage of the fact that other people have been there before. Similarly, you can never know too many people. So this goes back to my Apple days where my network was small because I was hidden from the developer community. Um, well, the iPhone developer community is actually, you can be out there and you can, you can have a personality and people can know you and you can build your network and then you can work together, right? Yes, we're competing against each other, but you know, engineers get in a room and have a beer and talk about the crazy bug they were solving and it's not like someone's going to not tell me about how to solve the bug I'm telling them about. So build your network. Code defensively, again, this goes back to, I don't really care about people who can write tremendous reams of brand new beautiful code. It's actually much more important to me that people write code um, carefully. <laughs> and I don't need it to be the most sort of intelligent, exciting, innovative code. I need it to be well defended. It needs to be as bug free as possible. Um, and there are processes that you can learn and sort of ways that you can go about making sure that you write good code. Um, and that goes to establishing some best practices for coding. So what are the best practices for coding generally, independent of iPhone? Please don't be cute. Um, it's very possible to be very cute in code. Um, there are obfuscated code comp contests you can enter if you feel like you, know, you need to get that out of your system. Don't do that in the code base that you're developing professionally and your new teammate, your new teammate will not appreciate how smart you are nearly as much as you appreciate it. Um, another thing that my team in particular kind of dislikes about me, I'll admit, is I am a warnings are errors nightmare. I do not let people turn that off. Warnings are errors. <laughs> so <laughs> warnings are there for a reason. I've worked with code bases that would generate 500 warnings on a regular basis because people left warnings or errors off. And the problem is maybe those 500 warnings are actually, you know, not very important. The 500 first, could be a terrible, horrible bug that you're gonna miss because it's lost in a sea of warnings. So I encourage you to believe that warnings are errors. Um, I'm not a particularly prolific or genius coder, and so I actually step through all the new code that I write. Um, that's how I know it's working. So not everybody needs to do that. I realize that that's a very, very conservative maneuver on my part, but it's not a bad thing to do if you have the time. The other thing you can do to make sure your new code is working is write unit tests but I encourage you to actually proactively do something so that you know that the new code you've written is working. Um, the other thing that I learned at Apple and that I was surprised to learn a lot of developers don't know how to do outside of Apple is use the available tools to periodically check for things like leaks and memory smashers and other sort of resource misbehavior. Um, so Apple provides an incredible suite of tools for introspecting into your code, profiling, watching what you're doing with memory, watching object allocations and deallocations, putting guard pages around memory so that you can see if you're overwriting or underwriting. Use those tools, learn how to use them. It's a valuable investment of your time and periodically look for those things as you're developing even if you don't see any misbehavior in your code. 
I guarantee you, you're going to find that you did something stupid and you can fix it before you ship and before your customer ever suffers from the bug. Um, and then the last thing, which is near and dear to my heart because I've done internet dependent applications for my entire career is use a sniffer to verify your HTTP traffic or your other network traffic if you're doing a network enabled application. The most, the most common thing that basically anybody who's been doing internet savvy applications for a living will be able to tell you a horror story about is you write your own distributed denial of service attack. So I've done that twice. <laughs> it happens. Um, I will say when I was managing the team that did uh, PubSub at Apple, we had a bug in our PubSub framework that you know, basically was pinging a particular server way too frequently because everyone had that server in their default bookmarks. And that's a lot of people when you're talking about you know, the default installs of Safari. Um, and more recently at Tapulous, we had this problem as well. There was a bug in TTR2 in the first version in .o where the way that we get ad configuration from our server uh, was there was a bug and it was essentially a DDoS against our own servers and it's a nightmare to deal with that. So what I encourage you to do is proactively use an HTTP sniffer. Um, HTTP scoop is my favorite. It's really, really easy. Um, and watch your packets and make sure that you're not doing something crazy. Okay, so iPhone specific best practices. Um, briefly, it's just like Mac OS X, right? And so for those of you who've been doing Mac OS X development, well, this is super easy to transfer your skills. Wrong. <laughs> this has been the biggest technical challenge for me in my career, I think. Um, so I, I knew Mac OS X like the back of my hand. Uh, iPhone is based on Mac OS X. It's a version of Mac OS X, so to speak, but it's an embedded system. And it's got lots of APIs that operate only on that device. And the device itself has hardware characteristics that are totally iPhone specific. I suggest you approach it as a completely new platform. Um, Use real devices for testing regularly. What we found is that people rely on their simulator way too much. Um, for us, it's because it takes a long time to install some of our applications to the device. Uh, we've got payloads of maybe 50 megs of songs and graphics. So that, that takes a long time to install. The Problem is the simulator does not accurately simulate everything about the device. And so I really encourage you to take the time to install to your device on a daily basis and run tests on your device. Um, simulator's great for quick coding and seeing if, you know, that feature you just wrote is basically working, but it is not a substitute for testing on the device. Um, the other thing that I think people don't spend a lot of time thinking about that we've been bitten by and so from experience I know to think about is that offline and bad edge connections are actually the most common use cases for these devices. So we're in Palo Alto, right? So we've got four bars of 3G or we're on someone's Wi-Fi network and it's got a strong signal and high bandwidth. Well, that's like a, an iPhone dream. <laughs> and it's a dream that is not reality. So <laughs> make sure that you test everything in your app in you know, airplane mode and uh, disable 3G and Wi-Fi and make sure that you go into a basement and have a really bad edge connection. And uh, you'll find that things misbehave in interesting ways and you'll want to address that before you ship. Okay, so wrapping up. The iTunes App Store is a crazy and fun marketplace. Individual people can ship wildly popular apps. They can be marketed by Apple, as I said, and show up on billboards across the world. It's fantastically fun. It's very fast paced. I can't blame you for wanting to get into it. The iPhone OS, similarly, is a crazy and fun platform. You can bring up an app in a day and you can make very rapid changes to it. You can rapidly prototype with the simulator and with interfa interface builder. There are new APIs being added all the time that keep the thing really stimulating, even for people who know the device and the platform well. It's great. You can be an indie and be a success, and a lot of people do that. I know you've heard from those folks already here where you know, an individual has had fantastic success with an app, but I guess what I want to close by saying is that you can also build a company and be a success, and I think Tapulous is proof of that. Right? As I was saying earlier, we now are a 15-person company, and we are largely self-sustaining. We've been profitable, profitable a couple of months in the past six months. We're not routinely profitable yet, but we have a trajectory where we can get there. And as I said, you know, we've got 10 million unique users or more, uh, 100 million games played, and we can have a sustainable business based on this, on this market and this OS. And so I encourage you to sort of jump into the fray and build a business out of it. Don't just, don't just necessarily sit in your bedroom and do it by yourself. Um, P.S. We love interns, <laughs> so I have to pitch that. Um, Stanford is a fantastic place to solicit interns from. 
uh, I can't possibly find a better place than the iPhone class at Stanford to solicit interns from. So if you're interested, send your resume and your cover letter to jobs at Tafulis. I'd love to hear from you. And I guess I'll just sort of open it up to any questions you have about Tapulis, about engineering on the iPhone, about our specific products, really anything if you have a question to ask. So the question is, do we have a separate QA function at Tapulis? And the answer is no. Um, a lot of that is uh, basically because we're a scrappy little startup, right? And so we are very careful about how we spend our money and we have limits on headcount. Um, and so at the moment, we don't have the ability to take on a full-time QA person. Some of that, though, is also uh, my Apple pedigree. Um, although there are dedicated QA people at Apple, um, and they're fantastic, uh, the burden of initial quality assurance uh, in any given product is definitely very heavily placed on the individual engineer at Apple. Um, and so, again, I don't believe that that's a complete substitute for having a professional quality assurance engineer. I would love to have one. <laughs> um, but I do think you can do a lot as an engineer to test your own code, test your own products, and just build that into uh, sort of the, the vibe and the religion of your company. Um, so that's what we're doing right now. And, and when we get ready to ship a product like TopTop Top Revenge 2, one of our big ones, um, the entire company spends probably a whole day testing the app. We all get together and we bang on it as a team. It's great fun. And, uh, you know, we find, we find the lion's share of problems. We don't find them all. So um, any other questions? Uh, I'll skip to back there and then I'll get you. So how many users do you have again? So the question is how many users do we have? Um, we have over 10 million unique installs. Um, so that's per device versus per user. We can't know about individual human beings, but, uh, but probably about 10 million. Yeah, um, you know, so uh, the question was, uh, how realistic is it to build a business uh, on this platform and in this marketplace, given that uh, my company has the number one game and we can support 15 employees? Um, so really, how much success is out there? And uh, I was talking actually with, with my boss, Bart, about this earlier today, and he likened it to um, the early days of the web. Um, so I, I think, you know, do I think that there are massive successes still waiting out there to happen? Yeah, I think that there probably are, you know, the Facebooks still out there um, waiting to happen. And it could be that an individual produces that out of his or her bedroom, and it could be that a small company like Tapulis produces that. And, and frankly, we kind of have started to produce that, right? We, as you pointed out, we have the number one game. Um, we also are extremely scrappy, right? We're, we're angel funded, we have not sought venture money. Um, and so we're 15 people because that's a nice, comfortable size for us, and we feel that we can break even at a relatively early trajectory. Uh, with that size. Could we grow faster and could we be producing more and could we go seeking venture? I think we could, right? We could be on that faster pace. We just choose not to, um, but that may be perfectly viable for other folks who want to go that route in this marketplace, I, I think. Um, Are they our age? Or? Sure. Um, so the question is, can I talk a little bit about the founders of Tapulis and their background and their, their story? Um, so the two founders that are at the company are um, Bart DeCrem and Andrew Lacey. Bart de Krem, um, so and one of the sub questions was, are they our age? So our ages are wildly different in this room as I look around. Um, they're my age, <laughs> so um, you know, 30s to 40s, basically. Um, and so Bart's background is that he was a founder at Easel. He also was with the Mozilla Foundation for the launch of Firefox 1.0. Um, there's more information about him on our website with sort of details as to his background, but that's sort of a, a very brief summary of him. Um, he also has a JD from Stanford, I believe. Um, Andrew, uh, who is our COO, Bart is the CEO, um, Andrew has a business degree from Stanford here, uh, as well as a law degree from a university in Australia where he's from, um, and he is, uh, he's, he's relatively new to the high-tech startup land. He had been working for six years at McKinsey, which is a business consulting uh, place. So he had been into companies uh, guiding them, but had not been running a company himself. I believe this is his first startup. And you, you said you tried multiple so the question is, what were the other apps that we had tried when we were doing the slide or rock you strategy? And, and the addendum to that was what were the failures? And I'm going to correct that. I don't think any of them were failures. Um, so we have a number of really wonderful little what we kind of term baby apps 
But baby apps can be pretty good. Baby apps for Tapulous are, you know, they have between 10,000 and 350,000 users. So <laughs> it's, it's not a bad thing. Um, so the biggest one is Twinkle, uh, which is, you know, roughly 350,000 users. That's the one where 25 million messages have been sent with it. Um, other than that, we have one called Collage. Uh, which is a sort of social photo collage thing where people can share photos and they land down on the screen. Uh, we have Fortune, which was actually made by Kyle McComer, who I think is sitting back there. He's, he was our intern last summer, and uh, it's a fantastic little app. Um, Fortune Cookie that you can crack open by you know, shaking and interacting with the iPhone. Um, you can submit fortunes as well. Um, a bunch of other ones. They're, all, they're, they're on our website, so I would check tapulous.com. But in total, I think we've got about, uh, I want to say, 11 or so offerings out on the App Store right now. That's a really good question. So the question was, we have a bunch of these apps that are premium apps that I said very quickly were based on TapTap Tap Revenge in terms of their core technology, but we build these different premium apps for Coldplay and Nine Inch Nails and Weezer, and we did a dance one with a mixture of DJ music in it. So how do we manage all that content? Um, that was not a solution that was easily arrived at, and it's something worth thinking hard about. What we ended up doing is basically building a static library that is our core engine, which is stuff that is not different from game to game. And then we can really easily spawn new application projects from a template, in essence, where um, you can override resources and code that's in the core uh, with customized stuff for the you know, different applications. Uh, really easily, I'm gonna back up. I'll say straightforward versus easy. Um, it's, it's, none of it's easy. Um, <laughs> but basically, we, we reuse as much code as we possibly can, and in fact, we try to ensure that it's compiled exactly the same way by using this library. Uh, it reduces our quality assurance burden uh, by ensuring that the same code is executing sort of as much as possible, only the stuff that we have to customize is different. No, the question is, um, is it difficult to get past Apple when we have apps that are largely the same, but just some of the content is different? In fact, I, you know, Apple's review process is a black box, and I will assure you it is as much of a black box to Tapulous, which is a very large app developer, as it is to any of you. Uh, we don't get special treatment, by and large, and so I can't really answer, is it difficult to get past, because I don't really know if they're you know, giving additional scrutiny uh, to things like that, but, but my impression is actually that it might be slightly easier. right? If, if it's quite clear that it's an incremental change from something that they've already approved, my impression is it might be slightly easier to get it reviewed, but again, that's total speculation on my part. Um, in the front? Good. Right, so the question is, um, how do users report bugs, and is it good to have an in-app way to report bugs? So. For us, we use Get Satisfaction, which is a website that's commonly used by a bunch of relatively large companies, um, as well as little guys like us. Um, and it's a nice support forum where you know employees like myself can sign up and mark myself as an employee, and I watch things come in and I answer questions, and then we translate things that are real bugs there over into our ticket system to get them fixed. We don't have an in-app bug reporting system. Um, you know, in some ways, I could see that that would be really useful, but. Um, Boy, that sounds like that would add a lot of complexity. And it sounds like you might actually generate more bugs for yourself by trying to put an in-app bug reporting system into your app. So if you have nothing else to do, maybe try that. But I, I don't know. I, I might build features that the user would actually want to interact with and play with and enjoy versus a bug reporting system. One thing I should note, though, that Apple just put into iTunes Connect, maybe it was about a week and a half ago and caused me to jump for joy, is crash reports. So do definitely save your built binaries and your dsims, which are your symbol files, save them from your builds, so then you can go back and symbolicate those crash reports that Apple is now making available to you. We just fixed a ton of crashes that we were previously unaware of in TapTap Tap Revenge, uh, so we'll be shipping an update soon that's a lot more stable, and I'm thrilled about it. That's sort of the biggest leap forward for uh, you know, fixing bugs on this platform. Any other, oh God, I have so many. Um, I'll go to the back. Sure. Um, so we have ended up um, hosting our, our ticket system and our version control. Um, so we're, I, I looked at a whole bunch of different hosted solutions and sort of compared them for feature set and price. And I went with a, a company called Unfuddle, um, which is unfuddle.com. It's Subversion, um, or I want to say they also support Git. I'm pretty sure they do. Um, and a fantastic you know, wiki and um, ticket system and uh, you know, it, it's quite full featured and I think they have a free trial and, and their prices are quite reasonable for relatively small accounts. So, 
Um, sure. Oh yes, absolutely. So the question is, um, if your app crashes and you're not connected to your computer, can you retrieve that crash report? Absolutely. So just plug your phone in when you do get to your computer. Um, go to Xcode and bring up the organizer window. Um, select your device, and in there you can select a tab for crash logs, and um, all the crash logs on your device are available there. Um, and you just need to be able to symbolicate them. If, you're, if you were running a release build that had symbols stripped, you have to be able to symbolicate them. So keep, keep your binaries and your symbol files. I can't say that enough. <laughs> um, anything else, Troy? And uh, what were some of your biggest, I guess, technical challenges coming from Mac OS X to iPhone? You said like, this is one of your biggest challenges. Good point. So Troy asked, um, what were the biggest challenges moving from Mac OS X, the desktop platform, to iPhone for me? Um, an embedded system is a very different beast from a very high-powered modern desktop or laptop machine. And so, right, at Apple, I was certainly not taught to be cavalier about using system resources. Far from it. Performance was one of the things that was paramount. Um, however, even if you're not being cavalier, the simple fact is there's a very usable VM system <laughs> and most machines have about two gigs of RAM in them. Um, so that actually far and away has been the single biggest challenge because uh, I, you know, even though I'm the ripe old age of 34, I learned to program already in a time where RAM was relatively cheap and ubiquitous and so you did not pay much attention to how much you were allocating or at what time. Um, the iPhone OS is brutal. If you allocate too much memory, <laughs> either over time or all at once, you will be ejected, <laughs> like <laughs> very unceremoniously. You will get some warnings from the operating system if you're lucky, and then you will be quit. Um, so that has been the single biggest challenge, is learning how to be very conservative with memory usage. Um, but other things related to embedded systems programming as well. So, you know, just learning how to use OpenGL ES versus OpenGL for the desktop system. And again, making sure that you pay attention to things like really bad edge connections and offline use and, and so on. But the memory, I think, is the biggest thing. Any other questions in the front? Um, so the question is, how difficult would it be to port our games over to another platform like Android? Um, porting, porting is... Porting is not rocket science, right? You're not developing a brand new game. However, it's relatively complex considering much of our code is written in Objective-C. Um, I've been through this experience before at Apple where I had a large Objective-C code base and it needed to be made, to, needed to be made cross-platform. Uh, what we ended up doing there was rewriting from scratch in C++. Um, a platform like Android or like the BlackBerry would be a similar pursuit, right? So we don't have to invent new features and we don't have to sort of spend a lot of time brainstorming, but it's just like a hard slog of rewriting a lot of Objective-C in Java or another cross-platform language. Um, and then on some platforms, they don't have the touch interface or multi-touch interface, and so that would be a real bummer for TapTap -Tap Revenge in particular. Um, and also if they don't have uh, OpenGL, um, that would be, a, a severe problem for us. It's possible, right, to drop down to lower graphic system layers and start, you know, blitting to the screen, but wow, um, <laughs> that would be a lot of work. I would really prefer to use OpenGL, so. Uh, anything else? I guess that's it. Well, thank you so much for your time, and uh, yeah. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.